Hello students! Greetings from virtual reality. Today I decided to try on a different superhero identity, and I am the Brock Eliza. My sister still wanted to be Red Panda. She was always smarter than me. So you have super broccoli powers. I don't get your little brother. Please Red Panda, I prefer to be called Brock Eliza, at least for today. Whatever. Let's get this show on the road for these nice students out there. They're almost finished with the semester. Yes, we are in a home stretch for sure. You students have come a long way and I know if you've been taking care of all to-do lists, self-testing at the end of each chapter and paying attention, you are doing well. Has it occurred to you that a to-do list is a good idea in all your courses? That's a good point, Red Panda. I have a habit of making lists all the time. It keeps me aware of what I need to get done each day. We all need to be organized and focus on using our time wisely. Time management skills are key to success in anything. You bet. Okay, end of pep talk. Mr. Franks I mean, Rockalizer. In this lesson we are looking at three chapters in our text. The first chapter 19 deals with the effectiveness of policies and programs aimed at preventing or reducing delinquency. If the material seems a bit vague, that's because it is actually quite difficult to measure success in policies and programs aimed at delinquent behavior. Many programs lose funding just when they seem to be having a positive impact, while others seem to receive funding forever despite the fact that they seem to be having little to no impact. Right Broccoli Head, an example I always use is the D.A.R.E. program. It makes a great bumper sticker, and you've probably all seen the D.A.R.E. officer's presentation at your local school. But kids often find this program merely entertaining, and by that I mean funny. I don't think it is really having much of an impact on alcohol and drug use by our young people. At least, there is no proof it has ever been very effective. But if you have seen it working, let others know on our discussion forum. Chapter 20 deals with the police and how they operate. You should know the difference between preventive patrol and community policing. I know you have seen examples all your life of the former, and probably know what the latter is. Have you seen much evidence of community policing in your hometown or neighborhood? A marked car or those unmarked cars that everyone knows are police cars, riding around with cops inside is thought to deter crime. I think seeing the cops riding around makes some people feel safer which is a good thing. And maybe sometimes if kids are thinking about doing something illegal, the sight of a squat car riding through the neighborhood will make them think twice. True, but my fear is they are just burning gas, not really crushing crime. Community policing makes much more sense to me in terms of preventing crime. But there are drawbacks here, too, such as a police officer living in an apartment complex, becoming too chummy with kids who are lawbreakers and not doing their job. The bottom line, preventive patrol is easier. Community policing makes sense, but can be tricky to pull off, and does put more pressure on police officers during their shift. By the way, cops typically call a work shift a tour. Okay then we move into chapter 21, and you've now caught and corrections. I used to have all my classes memorize a funny acronym that helped them remember the major steps in an ideal juvenile justice system. The trick worked and they loved saying the goofy acronym but there was one problem. When they got out into the real world, they realized there is probably no such thing as an ideal juvenile court as outlined in our textbook. Have you ever seen a juvenile court in action? How did it function? I think we all know what kids know. Most of the time, even if you get formally introduced to juvenile court, all you get is a slap on the wrist, supervised probation at best, and more likely regular probation. Most juvenile court probation officers are so overworked, they can't even begin to supervise all their case load effectively. So he won't require you to memorize steps that might exist in the perfect world juvenile court system. He does want you to know what regular probation is, what intermediate sanctions are, and of course the major goal of any juvenile court. Right Red Panda, this chapter interests me because of our Supreme Court's decisions in roughly the last quarter of the 20th century, and early in the 21st century that impact juvenile court and corrections. Some but not all due process rights that we as adults take for granted, but have been absent in juvenile courts, are now available to juveniles who break that law. Right on broccoli breath. Recently in 2012, the US Supreme Court ruled that no person who was sentenced to life without parole and had committed their crime before their 18th birthday could be held without parole under that sentence. This impacted about 50 inmates in Mississippi, persons who had been sentenced as adults to life without possibility of parole and had committed their crimes before turning 18. The US Supreme Court didn't say they could go free. 
just that parole had to be an option at some point for them. I assume you know that the US Supreme Court has also recently ruled that no state can sentence a person who committed their crime, before turning 18, to the death penalty. I wonder what these students know about the US Supreme Court and juvenile court systems and issues. Do they follow their noses and read outside the textbook very much? They do if they are curious about juvenile justice. Of course they do. Good. That makes me happy. I meet people who don't even know the difference between the Mississippi Supreme Court and the US Supreme Court. That is surprising and sad. We should all know a lot about our systems of justice in America. After all, the information is all at our fingertips. Oh yeah, love me some internet, and the government puts more public information now than ever. I'll bet these students read about different aspects of the justice systems we have all the time. I hope you're right, Red Panda. One thing I hope they are aware of is that Mississippi has a long and ugly history with training schools and juvenile corrections. They need to know what a training school is and a boot camp and wilderness or outdoor programs. Wow, this should be a very lively discussion for them. If these super students can read about all these different ways juveniles have been and are treated in what's called juvenile corrections and not of opinions on what they're reading, I'll be shocked. Never fear, Red Panther. These students are very bright and very curious. And that brings us to... The end of this mini-lecture, already? Yes, we're going to finish line in the course, and time has flown by faster than broccoli man can say, or you can eat salad bar. Okay, well there's that. I hope they all keep doing their best, and taking care of those to do lists in each lesson. Until next time, have fun and please be safe. A lot of people care about you. That's true. We hope none of them drink and drive, or text and drive. That would be foolish and dangerous. Not fun nor safe. Peace out, super students.